Hi, my name's Chris Toombs. I'm a velocity-based training expert and performance specialist. I'm here with Output Sports in Dublin talking all things velocity-based training. What we'll do with the load velocity profile is actually work across a range of um, loads, fixed loads, to establish the relationship between speed and force application. Okay. So from light weights right the way through to heavy weights. Then from there, even though rep max prescription is not an exact science, we'll have a much, much better appreciation of how you move low loads and, and high loads and okay. the relationship between the two. So as you can see on this table here on the right-hand side, irrespective of how strong you are, so you've got 1RM of 80, 1RM of 100, or 1RM of 127, the minimum velocity threshold, the speed at which you cannot complete a rep, is the same irrespective of strength level. So we will all you know, basically divert to 0.25 meters per second irrespective of our strength levels in the squat. Minimum velocity threshold is exercise specific. But that, that's where I've got a buffer and a protection mechanism as a coach and you as an athlete to understand if you're squatting at 0.4 meters per second, you've got reps in reserve. That's, okay, yeah. al that's ultimately what that does because minimum velocity threshold for normative 99% of people outside of powerlifting realms 0.25 meters per second is minimum velocity threshold. Okay. So we know if you're moving the bar at 0.6 meters per second, you're in a, you're in a safe zone. There's no near, you exactly. should be nowhere near yeah. failure. Exactly. So, so in terms of our load velocity profiling, what we want to try and do is capture five or six data points evenly spread across the spectrum from 25 to 30% of one rep max all the way through to in and around 80% of, of one rep max to gather intelligence across the full spectrum. So the first one we'll start on is essentially an unloaded bar, 20, 20 kgs. So from here, a bit like your assessment and jump squat, you have the capability to, to jump with this. So show maximum intent and just squat three depth, just, just three reps. Again, squat depth for me is all about your natural squat depth. Okay. If it's too shallow or if it's too deep, then I'll, I'll talk to you about that, but ultimately, this is about you squatting to your natural squat depth. Okay. Consistent. Yeah, brilliant. Comfortable? Yeah. So the second challenge here, I guess, from our point of view as coaches, is when you've done your counter movement jump as your readiness assessment, you've jumped and you've got off the ground. You have the capability to do that here as well. It's just whether you, as a, uh, from a quality assurance standpoint and test, retest sort of valid validity and reliability, if you squat the same way throughout this process going forward, then we've got good, robust okay. data. If next week, for example, I ask you to jump, then inevitably apples today will be oranges next week. So inevitably, this is the start point of a journey on capturing good data. So if you capture the squat without getting off the ground now, but you're still moving with maximum intent, and we can replicate that, then obviously we're gonna get good data. Okay. So that's the kind of, I guess, the technical element going forward. Yeah. Realistically, it's getting across high load, a low load, high speed, high load, low speed, and, and the, the data points in between. So we, we go again, just three move reps. it. Yeah, three reps, is that? Move. Because your 20 and your 40 kilo numbers are almost identical, yeah. it tells me that I've probably underestimated the, the, the gap between the fixed loads. Okay. Ideally, for me as a coach, I want to try and get five evenly spaced loads. You've predicted your one rep max at about 140, which is yeah. no, no, in a, in a heavy. So in, in the real world, I probably wanted to do 20, 50, 80, 110, okay. and have a look from there. But I didn't want to push you too hard today for lots of different reasons. For test, retest reliability as well, always use the same fixed loads. Okay. So there's no point in us now doing a 50 for next test because we did a 40 for this test. So you've almost got to be consistent with your exposure to the data points. If I could do this again tomorrow, knowing a bit more about our athlete, 
I would go, I literally go to my hunch. 20 kgs, 50 kgs, 80 kgs. And if you're like doing it with different athletes, I presume the gaps, so like the 20 it's, to 50, it's just specific to the athlete. Individualization, absolutely. That's one of the key, goal, the key goals of ours is individualize our programming as best we can. So your load velocity profile will be yours and individually specific to you. Stevens will be Stevens. So yeah, different protocols. Every, and yeah, and there'll be a different, the process is the same in yeah. terms of getting the data points captured, but actually the, the fixed loads will be different. So if, you, if I know you can squat 200, there's probably 40 kilos between each data point, whereas at the moment we're going up in tens because I'm sort of finding my way with, with yeah. my athlete at the same time. Yeah. So I'd rather act conservatively than overload you to the point where you fall off the cliff too early. Happy? Yeah. Comfortable? Yeah. Normal squat range? Yeah, I think. Fair yeah. play. I mean, yeah, no, I've, I'm making an observation. Two things here now. Once the weights start to become a little bit heavier, technical execution of the lifting is still the vitally most important component. Chasing velocity is not something as a coach that I'm trying to drive. Yes, we want to, athletes to drive intent, but we also want, first and foremost, technical excellence when it comes to lifting the reps. And I presume throughout you want kind of the same depth. The same consistent depth. I mean, I'm just watching from a coaching perspective. That observation looks to me 40 kilos, 60 kilos, 80 kilos, you've got consistent depth. I mean, I'm not measuring it to the millimeter, yeah. but to the coach's eye, you're seeing consistency. Yeah. And that's the challenge you've got. As soon as the weights start to become a little bit heavier, the natural thing for athletes to do is make their range slightly shallower so they don't obviously stress the the full concentric range the same way, of course, it makes it easier. The indications for me are that I have a strong athlete in front of me because the curve, or the, sorry, the graph line is very shallow. What you find with weaker athletes is the graph line is much steeper because what you'll have, a bit like the one, one I showed you there, the one who had the 127 1RM, much, much shallower regression towards, velocity, uh, towards minimum velocity threshold, whereas those who are weak, basically, will, the force end of the curve is their limiting factor. So you'll see, you know, both your, if we're talking minimum velocity threshold here, you're, you're a million miles away from it. But the weaker athlete with that steepness of the curve, or steepness of the graph, sorry, much, much nearer their, their failure point, they get there much quicker. So over four data points already, we're probably nowhere near. No, realistically, we're nowhere near your one rep, your one rep max. We're like, I, mean, I wouldn't say 40%, but you're probably, you're probably only 60% there. Yeah. The load velocity profiling gets graphed automatically based off the data that we're generating right now, which from an end user perspective is absolutely brilliant from a, from a timestamp standpoint in terms of you know, the time efficiency, the, the Excel wizards out there can inevitably prov provide a load velocity profile in seconds, but this has done exactly the same thing based off the data we're capturing. And interestingly, from my point of view as a coach who's used velocity-based training for a long, long time, we had a conversation around estimated 1RM as part of our precursor to this load velocity profiling. You came out with what, 130? In and around 130, we've got a prediction for today and that's important from a velocity-based training standpoint, the strength level of an athlete today, 132.5. So I think our athletes in tune with their kind of relative strength levels, but also the data that we're generating is validating some of our thinking around where that one rep max was for, the, for any given day and our athletes' kind of training status. That makes my life as a coach unbelievably much easier and simpler. And anyone else who's got that barrier of entry, or oh, I don't want to spend my time in front of a laptop, does it for you automatically. That is absolute gold. From a practitioner standpoint, seriously, that is high value. When it's lighter loads, you can essentially, you know, do a slightly higher rep. Three, three, two, one, one. So in, a real, in the ideal world, I'd like five data points. Six is no issue. And if you've got the capabilities like the, like the portal provides you when 
the graphs are being plotted automatically. Whether it's five, whether it's six, whether it's seven, it doesn't really matter. What we try and do is get evenly spaced across the full spectrum, 30% okay. uh, 1RM through to 80. So this will be nearer, it's nowhere near 1RM, because we know that 1RM is about 132. So this is still 100 kilos, it's only about 70% 1RM max. Two reps. Keep that form, because the form's exceptional. Intense, great, great. Keep that range. You'll catch, catch up slow. Nice. 0.5, best rep. Shallower, second rep. Yeah. 0.4, yeah. You notice it yourself. Yeah. There's coaching moments within, within training and within profiling. There's a, you, the athlete's in tune with their own body, but she knew she was shallow in second rep. And I, as a coach, saw that. But I also thought it'd be quicker because you shallowed the range up. But you've also done, you know, you it's the accumulation of loading now starts to take a level of effect. When you think about linear regression and speed, speed and loading, you've got, you've literally got, yeah, an, a nice pattern of cluster, which I guess does almost again validate to some degree that, you know, 20, meter, uh, 20 kilo imp increments is... Um, is possibly. Is a 0.25 you said is? 0.25 is minimum length. velocity threshold. It's, yeah, normatively, for 99% of people, it's the same. Okay. There's only the, the outlying population will probably be your powerlifting group who can grind at 0 0.2, 0 0.18 yeah. for squat. And for things like bench press, it's about 0.1 meter per second. So the minimum velocity threshold changes for different activities. Okay. Yeah, 0.5 meters per second. So 0.54 meters per second is essentially 80% of one rep max. That potentiates you. Your session this afternoon is going to be so much better, so much better. But that that gives us enough information, even even because we've plotted at 100 kilos, which is at 0.5 meters per second, which is we've gone from what 20 kilos to 100 kilos. So we've got a good broad spectrum. So in, inevitably, for me now, load management and load adjustment within sessions is going to be goal dependent. So whether you want you want to develop power, whether you want to develop um, maximum strength qualities, that sort of thing. But I mean, so the load velocity profile then allows us to be very, very precise with our prescription. Without that, we're kind of guessing. Yeah. So that's why one of the key benefits of load velocity profiling is understanding then how precisely we can load to develop different strength qualities. Yeah. Yeah. Different yeah, so now if I want you to move the bar at 1.25 meters per second, because I've profiled you today, the accuracy of that can be absolutely to the kilo. Same for Pmax, which is about 50% of one rep max. Same if we want to develop maximum strength qualities. And then you can target specifics. And we can target specifics and do as low volume as you need or as much volume as you need. And there's a sweet spot there.